Thanks for coming, and uh, get Steve Nelson here from the Left Two Retirement Board. Uh, not as many people here as I thought, but I got a handout, and we'll be taking questions. I'm audio and video recording this for those of you uh, that uh, have friends that couldn't make it, and uh, want to let them know. And um, just ask questions. It's non-casual. Water over there. I mean, it's casual. And uh, just let him let Steve start. All right. Uh... As Bill said, my name is Steve Nelson. I'm the director of the Left Plan 2 Retirement Board. Um, have any of you guys ever heard me talk before at like a FOP or WACOPS or any event like that? All right. Brief then by way of background, the Left Board was created about eight years ago uh, as a governance body for the Left Plan 2 Retirement System. I was hired as their first executive director and had served there ever since. Before that, my uh, career was uh, primarily working with the legislature and with the Department of Retirement Systems, almost exclusively on uh, pensions. The um, uh, kind of the purpose or the idea for today's meeting, I was just going to give you a brief recap. It's in your handout, so I'll be really brief about stuff that happened and didn't happen last session and then throw it open for questions. I did get some written questions ahead of time, but uh, really anything that you guys have on your mind is fair game. So with that, the top priority of the left board going into this session was to get full funding for left plan two. The left board adopts the contribution rates for the plan that are paid by the members and the employers in the state. And, uh, that was a challenging goal. The state had an extraordinary budget deficit this past session, as I'm sure you're aware. There were cuts everywhere. There was a proposal to reduce the left to contribution rates, but that proposal uh, did not pass. So the number one goal was to get full funding. That goal was accomplished. The uh, second item, uh, furloughs. Uh, I don't know what's been going on up here in Skagit County in terms of public safety. Police and fire, for the most part, have avoided cuts and unpaid uh, vacation time, but it has happened in some jurisdictions, and it's certainly come up in a number of other jurisdictions as a uh, topic of bargaining. I know there have been a lot of salary freezes and some layoffs in some jurisdictions, there was a bill last session that did pass that provided if you have unpaid leave or if you have uh, some kind of salary cut in order to manage the or to deal with the uh, budget problems, that your pension will still be treated as if you had received your full salary. So that, that reduction, that temporary reduction that you might get in pay won't have a permanent effect on your left to pension. That bill, as I said, did pass. The, there were four bills then, other bills that didn't pass. I'll just cover them briefly. Two were bills that were recommended by the Left Two Board. One dealt with um, creating a presumption that certain heart attacks and strokes would be considered to be duty-related uh, if they uh, were within 24 hours of an extraordinarily uh, extraordinary physical exertion or unusual stressful event. That bill did not pass. Another bill is uh, dealt with uh, L&I benefits. If you're the surviving spouse of a law enforcement officer or firefighters killed in the line of duty, um, you're entitled to L&I benefits as well as left two benefits. But if you remarry, all your L&I benefits get cut off. Your left two benefits continue, but your L&I benefits don't. And depending on how much service you might have had, that um, your L&I benefits could very well be greater than your left two pension. The bill would have allowed the spouses to remarry without giving up their L&I benefits. That bill didn't pass. There were two other bills. They were not left two board bills, but they did affect left two that were introduced during session. Uh, one would have uh, suspended a payment uh, to the local public safety and 
and uh, count that's due in September of 2011, half of that payment actually would go to fund left to benefit improvements. It's the first payment that's due under a bill that was set up to create this revenue stream back in 2008. The bill would have suspended that first payment. That bill didn't pass, but uh, it doesn't look like they were going to hit the revenue trigger to require the payment anyway. So no bill, but probably also no payment. The uh, other bill, there was quite a bit of, um, oh, publicity is not the right word, but a lot of, a, of um, interest or uh, contention around towards the end of session dealt with a proposal to merge left plan one and left plan two. Uh, the bill was, wouldn't have changed benefits for either plan, so if you were in left two, you weren't going to get left one benefits. But similarly, if you were retired from left one, you weren't going to have any of your benefits cut. But the two funds were going to be financially merged, and uh, the state hoped to save some money there, and they were looking at that as an alternative to the rate reduction bill. And so it came up late in session after the House introduced their budget. There was a lot of um, questions about the, what does it do, what does it, do uh, what does it not do. The, that bill also did not end up passing. So even though the legislature at the time was saying one or the other is going to happen, there's going to be the left to rate reduction bill or there's going to be the merger, uh, and as a matter of fact, neither of those two bills passed. So those were sort of the six issues, if you will, that were the affected left to this session. The only one that passed was the furlough bill. None of the rest of them passed. In the case of the rate reduction bill, though, that was a good thing. I got a couple of questions sent to me ahead of time. First one was, I'd like to know how the 3% COLA works. If you retire after 20 years uh, and draw at 53, um, it's not a, so much a 3% COLA, but if you retire at age 50 and you've got 20 years of service, you take a 3% reduction for each year prior to 53. If you wait until you're 53, you avoid that reduction. So you're not getting a pension at 50 and then getting a 3% COLA on top of that. You can gain 3%, but that's by not retiring. If you retire at 50 with 20, what you get is the same COLA that everybody else gets. That's based on inflation. It's capped out at a maximum of 3%, but here, uh, particularly over the last decade, inflation has tended to be quite a bit lower than 3%. So the COLA is actually inflation-based. If you retire at 50, you get the same COLA as everybody else. Second question kind of adds several parts. Uh, left 2 employee has previous time in PERS 2. How does this time affect their left retirement? It doesn't affect their left retirement at all. But that previous PERS time, as long as you didn't pull your money out, that will entitle you to a PERS pension, and that PERS pension will be based on, probably, you know, on your highest salary, which will probably be your left salary. So you get a PERS pension. The only way it can affect your left to retirement is... Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you're 53 and you got 20 years of service, you can go out. Well, if those 20 years of service happen to be split, you know, 12 in left, 8 in PERS, you still could meet that 20-year uh, requirement. So that's really the only way it, uh, you know, it can affect the amount of your left two pension, but it could allow you to qualify <coughs> for that uh, 20 years of service early retirement. Do the months or years of service roll into left retirement if it was never touched? No. Stays in PERS. Eventually you'll get two separate checks, one from one a PERS retirement benefit and one the left. And did, does the left two employees beginning date, uh, higher date from the start of left or start of uh, PERS if employment was continuous? <coughs> And that's probably more an HR question. Your higher date doesn't affect your pension at all, uh, PERS or LEF. Um, so, uh, uh, so 
So that piece of it, your higher date's not going to matter uh, for your left benefit, for instance. Um, that's kind of covered those questions, but then I'd be happy to answer questions about any session, uh, go into any more detail or any other questions that you guys have. Uh, qu questions about the board, I can talk a little bit about the sort of the plan, uh, the, what it looks like is on the interim for this upcoming, you know, leading up to next session, if that would be helpful. Like I said, this is being audio and video recorded, and the only way to get it on tape is to talk into the microphone. If you have a good question, I'd appreciate it, and so would other people if you'd at least talk into the microphone here. Thank you. I'm just trying to get some clarification on calculation of benefit. I've heard two different um, trains of thought. One is for the final average salary. One is your final four, five years that you work, and another one is the highest five consecutive years. I don't know which one is true. It's your highest 60 consecutive months is technically how it is. So it's your highest period of salary, not necessarily your last uh, years of service. If you um, happen to... Um, you know, uh, change jobs or something like that, move into something that's lower pay towards the end of your career. Uh, they'll DRS, the Department of Retirement Systems, they find the 60 consecutive months that your salary is the highest reported to them, and they'll base your benefit off of that. The, um, let me briefly talk a little bit then about what's on tap for the uh, interim, at least for the left two board. There are kind of three major issues that are brewing. Uh, first off, I mentioned earlier the left one, left two merger. Although the bill didn't pass, there was a requirement in the budget for the state actuary to study that issue this interim and to get the input of the left two board. So the board will be uh, studying that issue in the interim. In fact, it's scheduled to be on the agenda for their next meeting, which is July 29th. If you guys haven't already been out to the Left 2 Board website, all the materials that the board members get are out there on the website. And um, uh, there's the philosophy of the board is kind of 100% transparency. Usually the materials are out there, um, or frequently anyway, I should say, even ahead of the meeting time. And uh, all the stuff from past uh, meetings going back to the beginning of the board re remains out there. So anything that they've ever looked at, you can look at yourself. The, in addition to the merger issue, uh, the Department of Labor and Industries was required to do a study uh, scheduled to be completed in December of 2012 on occupational illnesses and uh, so duty-related illnesses, if you will. That could, uh, since LNI's determination about whether an injury or illness is duty related, is also the determination about whether that um, injury or illness qualifies for duty related death or disability benefits, that could have a spillover into left two. And so we'll be uh, either working with or monitoring the Department of Labor and Industries as they conduct this study. They haven't uh, the framework or their plan for that study hasn't been decided yet. The, uh, they're, you know, it just came out at the end of the special session with the budget. The budget was just signed a couple days ago. So they're sorting through how that's going to handle. That'll be something we'll be working on this interim and next one way or another, though. And then a third issue has to do with the state patrol. Uh, troopers have their own retirement system. It's got two plans. Uh, Patrol 1, Patrol 2. Initially, when Patrol 2 was created, it was intended to be very close to left 2. Uh, time has gone by. They don't have their own board. Uh, there's been changes to left 2. The benefits have begun to diverge a little bit, and the troopers have been in contact with the board and with left 2 stakeholders about um, 
either being added to the left two board or getting their own board that would be supported by uh, left two board staff, uh, one or the other. And they, uh, at the left two board meeting yesterday, the first meeting of the year, they reiterated that request. They'd like to work on that again this interim. So that may be something that you hear more about. They'll be working with all the stakeholder groups. So if you guys are associated with um, FOP or WALCOPS or something like that, you'll probably be hearing about it through those groups as well. But that those three issues are sort of on the agenda for the interim for sure. Supplemental budget. Uh, they had some money in reserve. The revenue forecast came out today. It was... Um, down, but not down enough that it looks like they're going to uh, have to come up with more money than, res than what they held in reserve. That issue could bring into play again this whole idea of lowering left two rates next year when uh, next January when they're back in session. So that's that's something we'll be uh, tracking as well, and we'll be working with legislators and legislative staff this interim to make. Uh, clear up some misunderstanding and confusion about left two rates uh, prior to next session. My question is just about the solvency of our retirement. We've all heard, you know, the stories about like Indiana's retirement going bankrupt and stuff. And I've heard ours is well managed, but I've also heard that the state is not paying their share into the retirement all the time for budget reasons. They're like deferring payments. Is that true? Um, yes. The state has been uh, deferring their payments to every other retirement system except LEP2. So let me start off, kind of take those questions in order. The solvency of LEP2. LEP2 is in uh, solid financial shape. Uh, there was a study of public uh, retirement funds that was recently done, statewide retirement funds, by the National Association of State Retirement Systems. And uh, they identified Left2 as one of the two best funds in the country. Uh, the policies that the board has been adopting uh, related to funding are being used right now by groups that are teaching retirement funds about best practices for fund management. The big recession that uh, the hit the market a couple of years ago, the losses from that are smoothed out over an eight-year period. So we've still got a significant uh, chunk of investment loss to make up over the next six years. But the rates that the board have established will make up that investment loss without a need to increase uh, rates at the end of those six years. If we get them, uh, just like I mentioned earlier, there was a proposal just this last session to reduce left two rates to about 90% of what would have been necessary. Uh, that was defeated for left two, but all the other plans, I, I'm in the PERS retirement system. Um, we got about, I think, about 90% of the um, expected long-term cost of the plan was the funding. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, Teachers One and PERS One. Those plans were fully funded, 100% funded, 10 years ago. And now they've dipped below 80, um, partly because of the investment losses, but largely due to uh, failure of the legislature to make the required contributions. And uh, that Last session, as a result, partly as a result of that, there was a the COLA for PERS-1 and TERS-1 retirees was repealed. Uh, so their COLA was taken away because of the funding problems that their plan was in. Left 2, you don't have to worry about that. That's one of the reasons why full funding for Left 2 has been the top priority of the board this past session and the previous session. Early indications are that, again, the supplemental budget next year and the next operating budget two years from now are both going to be kind of tight as well. So this is an issue that's not going to go away probably for at least uh, two more years. 
Uh, two questions. I, I didn't understand the PERS um, left thing um, completely. If someone in our department has two years in PERS uh -huh. and they have 18 years in left and they're over 53, does that count as the 20 years? If they're over 53, they don't need the 20. They can retire anyway. But if they happen to be 50 and they had two years and 18 years, then they could retire under the 50-20. They'd have to take that 3% a year reduction. So it, that PERS time does count for meeting that 20-year requirement. But in left two, once you hit age 53, you can retire no matter how many years you have, as long as you got five. But do they get the full? They, they would get, in your example, they'd get 18 years out of um, worth of pension out of left two. They're two years in PERS time. They could take it then, but in PERS you can't retire until you're 65. Right. So that PERS benefit, even though it would be based on their left salary, it would be reduced for early retirement. Or they could just leave it until they're 65. Until they're 65, okay. and then they get it with no reduction, and it would be based on their left salary. Okay. And then the other question was, um, there's four um, plans, right, for left two for, for your withdrawal of retirement as far as how much you get versus how much you and your spouse get if you pass away? You've got Yeah, you've got different options. That's right. Okay. So... Um, when we receive our retirement, I know we we pay 50 percent, the city pays 30, and the state pays 20. That's correct. Is that how we receive it back, or do we get? Does it come from our contribution first? In a, it comes just out of the fund. The, they do. Uh, there is a calculation that they do where they treat it as if it's coming from your money first. In the event, um, for instance. Let me back up a little bit. Say you picked an, a um, benefit where you didn't choose any survivor benefit. That's one of the four options. You've got four options when you retire. No survivor benefit, 100% of your benefit going to your spouse, two-thirds of your benefit going to your spouse, or 50% of your benefit going to the spouse. If you pick no benefit going to your spouse, and then something happened and two months after you retire, you die. What the Department of Retirement Systems would do is take uh, count sort of all the contributions and earnings that you had during your career, deduct those two months in that example worth of pension payments, and then still pay your spouse all the remainder of your contributions and interest. Thank you. And they keep that calculation running. It usually takes anywhere from two and a half to three and a half years to for your pension payments to kind of blow through all of your contributions and um, interest. So, sweet. Just to add on to Tom, uh, it was my example as far as the PERS and the left yeah. together. Okay. I just hate to cut out a couple of months early, but I've got four, four months or six months in PERS and the rest, uh, you know, 19 years in uh, in LEF. Um, so I started in April of 92 okay. in my PERS for six months. So am I going to be able to get my, my COLAs with the PERS and the LEF together? I'm, I'm, I'm 55. I'll be 55, so my age will be fine. Yeah. But or do you have to have 20 years in the LEF? to get your colas. Nope, you don't need 20 years in left. So if you're 55, you're already good. Um, your purse won't affect your left pension at all. So what's the earliest you can get your colas? Your cola starts in uh, July, and you have to be retired at least a year before you get your first cola. Okay. So for, um, well, let me see. That. So a lot of people will kind of think, well, maybe I'd better retire in, say, June, and then I'll get my first COLA 13 months later. Okay. Whereas if I retire in July, I won't get my first COLA for 23 months. But the Department of Retirement Systems tracks that time between you retire and the time you receive your first COLA. If you retire in July, you may not get your first COLA for 23 months, but it'll be a bigger COLA. So you get caught up 
regardless of when you retire. There's, you don't have to worry about timing your retirement to sort of uh, maximize your COLA. After you've been retired a couple of years, you'll be all caught up one way or another. So there's not a, a 20 year, you have to have 20 years and left to get, is there a minimum age? You just got to be 53 to get your COLAs? That's right, 53 and retired and you're going to get your COLA. No 20 years? Nope. That's, uh, there was some uh, stuff like that in some of the other plans. <laughs> no, you're good. Sell your life to you. Okay, thank you. All right, just and just hypothetically speaking, you know, if you happen to separate in the middle, of, yeah, if you happen to separate in the middle of a month, um, for DRS purposes, uh, your retirement date is the first. So just hypothetically, if you separated in June. Like you know, like like Monday, um, you know, your, your your retirement date would be July 1 of 2011, and you'd get your first COLA in uh, July of 2012, in that hypothetical example. For those very few of us that pay taxes on our contributions, yeah. is that broken down each month when we get the paycheck, and do they do they lay out what we paid taxes on versus what we haven't so yeah, that, that we can do that's a, our statements? That's a, that's a great question. What they, um, the Department of Retirement uh, Systems tracks your taxed and pre-taxed contributions separately. And so what ends up happening is they prorate your uh, pension. And so a piece of your pension will come to you untaxed based on how much of your service was uh that you already paid taxes on. And that will be recorded with your statement yep. so that you can have it for IRS. Yep. Okay. So all done automatically. It will be reported to you, but you won't have to do anything. So under the 60 months of your highest salary, is that the highest salary of your base pay, or does that also include overtime? Includes so, overtime. So if by the last five years that I decide to work, I jump on every bit of overtime and increase my salary. It's going to be based off of that. That's right. Left two, uh, overtime counts as salary for left two. So if you, if you work five years of overtime, by God, you've earned it. You've earned your pension <laughs> benefits. Um, and they're separate and apart from the pension impacts. I don't know what it's like here in SCAP, but I know there's been recruiting problems in a number of jurisdictions, staffing problems in a number of jurisdictions in the past, and a lot of um, a lot of places will use overtime to kind of help manage short staff problems. And there are a lot of places where they're working a significant amount of overtime because they have to. Um, it does count for their pensions. But whether they're paying a little bit of overtime to five guys or they're paying six guys regular salary, the pension fund, it all ends up working out the same. You pay contributions on that overtime just like your salary. So um, occasionally there'll be somebody that'll write in, like a newspaper article about how, oh, they're working all this overtime. Does that have a negative effect on the pension system? And it doesn't. Uh, the left to that was one of the reasons why the uh, salary period was stretched out from to five years is to avoid any kind of spiking if you could if if your salary was your pension was based on like one year of salary well then you you could do um, quite a bit of spiking with just one year of overtime but five years of overtime I th the legislature's kind of figured if you work five years of overtime by God you've earned it so If during the budget problems that the state has, if they decided, let's say, to increase, or can they decide to increase, like, the eight retirement age for left two to 55 or 56, could they bring it back there if they wanted to? That type of benefit change could only be made prospectively in the sense that it would only apply to new hires. It would be like creating a new plan. They can't change the retirement age for anybody who's already in the plan. You're... Pension benefits are considered a contract between you and the state, and the state cannot change the terms of that contract. So they could make it better, presumably, but not worse. That's right. Okay. 
not like Social Security where they raise. That's exactly right. Exactly different from Social Security. And um, the um, there have been some proposals. There have been some benefit cutbacks again in all the other plans, but not left to. Um, so that's uh, the board's. That's been one of the priorities. In fact, over the last eight years, there's been a 20 different improvements of one size or another. But uh, yes, um, I just a quick question on the merger. Is uh, the proposed merger is that something Left Two is spearheading as something they want to do or? Well, no. Um, the uh, initially the merger was brought up as an alternative to the underfunding. And I mentioned there were some legislators who kind of uh, pushed some of the stakeholder groups, Fraternal Order Police, uh, Council of Municipal Police and Sheriffs, uh, WACOPs, State Council of Firefighters, to say, uh, we need $15 million. That's how much the state was going to save in the underfunding bill. We need $15 million. We're going to get it from the merger or we're going to get it from the um, underfunding bill pick one or the other. And when they were faced with that choice, some of the uh, stakeholder groups did say, all things being equal, then in that case, we'd take the merger. However, neither passed. And um, now the issue is going to get, this is the first time that the issue will be studied by the left two board. So uh, the reason for that study, at least initially, is just based on this um, requirement, uh, legislative requirement that there be a study and that the left two board provide input. They will begin now considering the policy issue of a merger on its own, and I don't know where that's going to go. Um, I don't know whether there'll be a, a bill again next session, if it'll be supported by the groups. Um, initially, they supported it because it was an alternative to uh, the underfunding bill. Now that the underfunding issue appears to be resolved, they may not have any interest in pursuing the merger because the merger has pros and cons to it. Okay, well, if I understand left one right, they're, they're so well-funded that essentially there's going to be an excess once all the left one people, assuming they don't live to be 150 years old, um, once the fund is paid out for everybody that's in it or is going to be in it. And, and some reading I was doing on it, um, I understood that the legislature was essentially trying to steal from the pocket of Left One to fund their contribution to Left Two. Well, I wouldn't characterize it quite that way. Left One, um, <coughs> but let me just, Left One, as far as Left One being so well funded that they're going to have a surplus. That's not necessarily true. Um, again, they had the same market shock. If you assume that they're going to earn 8% a year from here on out, they do have enough assets to pay out all their projected benefits with a small surplus, but we're talking like 2% okay. left over. Um, and there is, because that assumes the 8% investment return, once the actuary goes through and figures out all the different possibilities for investment return, both above and below 8%, they projected that there was about a 30% uh, likelihood that at some point in time left one would run out of money. And essentially they would become a, um, what they'd go into what's called pay-as-you-go status. And they just, the benefits each year would be paid for out of the state budget as a, okay. So there is a uh, n not a negligible chance that left one could run out of money. Okay. They they could have um, a significant surplus if everything goes exactly according to plan. They'd wrap up with a small surplus, and uh, under existing law, that surplus would belong to the state, but they wouldn't be able to touch it until all the left one retirees and beneficiaries. We're gone. I just wanted to clarify on the furlough uh, retirement that just passed in mm -hmm. June. This was in effect earlier 
poor furloughs with left to if you were a state employee or all the PERS people were covered, uh, but county and city left to were not covered until this legislative session, which just started now, I guess, in July. So that's just going to be taking effect now for us. Is that that's right? Yeah, that's correct. The prior furlough bill was for PERS, uh, state and local. Um, there was a separate furlough bill that covered all state employees, regardless of what plan they were in. So that would have covered uh, state left two employees, but none of them had to take furloughs anyway, okay. uh, none of the state left two members. So this bill that begins July 1 will be the first bill that really has any practical effect for left two. And how are they, if they are, how are they uh collecting money on our end if we're taking furloughs for that pension, or are they? They're not. They're only taking uh, contributions on the salary that you actually get paid. So you'll get credit for salary that you don't pay contributions on. Okay. Thank and that's, that's part of the cost of the furlough bill. There'll be a – the actuary estimates that there'll be a small rate increase necessary to fund that bill based on um, projections for how many uh, left two members are going to have to take furloughs or salary cuts in the next two years. Any other questions? I'm trying to think how I want to word it. All right. We'll just throw it out there and we'll figure it out. So I'm also a reservist. So okay. if I'm called up for active duty reserve for the Coast Guard and am gone for a year, I understand I still get my credits. Yeah. Um, even though I'm not paying into the retirement system. Yeah. Um, the way it works for military, um, particularly during time of war, and this is still considered a time of war, you would, once you returned, to left to employment, you'd get credit for the time that you're gone. Uh, you would not have to pay contributions on that time. The state and the employer would still get billed for their share, though, once you came back. And then I'm guessing that then would not, that year would not count in, in the 60 months. You'd actually get credit for that year based on sort of what your salary was when you left and when you, and when you came back. So they'll kind of impute some salary to you, and it could still be part of your highest 60 consecutive months. Okay. Thank you. The um, handout has the board's website on it. It's got our phone number, and um, I can't remember now if it's got my email address on it or not. If you think of other questions, you can call or email now it's got the uh, board website up at the top, or email address, the recep at left.law.gov. Email or call, and I'd be happy to answer any additional questions that, that come up. It's going to be, there'll be a lot of stuff going on this interim. And, you, for instance, I'm sure you're going to hear a bunch of stuff about the merger. And uh, the um, rate thing may, there may be more attention on that. Uh, just remember, if you hear news articles or something about left under or about underfunding of pensions, they're not talking about you. You guys are good. They tend to sometimes, when they write these articles, paint things with a broad brush and um, sweep you guys in when you shouldn't be. So, um, but if anything comes up, whether it's a question about your individual stuff or questions about a bigger, you know. Uh, broader policy issue, please consider us a resource. Um, lots of times the board hears about issues that may, you know, require legislation to fix because somebody is going through a problem. Um, you know, somebody will come in and say, why didn't my first time uh, count? I, you know, I had 19 years and eight months in and, um, uh, you know, another four months of PERS time, and it didn't. If you hear, you know, those are the kind of things that we hear about, and then we can fix. So, um, 
please uh, don't you know don't hesitate to call or write if you have stuff come up. Okay, just to revisit this one more time. No worries. <laughs> On so, if someone is in PERS for two years, mm -hmm. um, and then they're in um, left for eight years, but mm -hmm. they pass 53, what what are they going to see in their retirement? Uh, they're going to see a left pension based on eight years, so 16% of their average final salary. They'll be able to start receiving that immediately with no reduction, and they'll get it for life. Then they will be entitled to get a PERS pension based on those two years. They can start receiving it immediately with a reduction, or they can leave it alone until they hit 65 and then begin taking it at 65 with no reduction. Okay, so if they do that, you did the two years in PERS, uh -huh. and then you, you did your eight years in left. That's all you did, 10 years. Yep. And you get out at 53. Is uh, um, Do they get a COLA every year that they haven't drawn on that, or does that just, it, it just, it's in the bank? That's what you're going to get at 65. Yeah, that's how it works. You don't get a, you won't get a cola imputed on it um, from 53 to 65. So you'll start drawing your benefit at 65, and then you'll get a cola. If you start drawing it at 53 with the reduction, um, even though it'll be a brutal early retirement reduction, you would then start getting a cola on it though immediately. So by the time you hit 65, you would have, you know. 12 years worth of coal is added to it right. uh, to help make up for some of that. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, years ago, amongst I think most of us, there's, there was a rumor floating in regards to, um, I, I, I think it was more just floating the notion than anything else, but uh, about a left three. Have you heard, or is there any talk at all about that? No, back in, back around early 2000s, um, between, there, well, the state was considering, and, and then they ended up adopting a Teachers Plan 3 and a uh, PERS Plan 3 and a, a School Employees Plan 3. There was some talk way back then about also potentially a left 3. That never amounted to anything, and there's never been any push for a left three since then. Um, so there's no, there's certainly no left three on the horizon. That's it. That's it. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate you guys having me here, and again. Uh, use use us as a reference call right if other questions come up you think of something on your drive home or something crazy happens a week from now and you're uh, like oh I wonder please let us know thank you thank you thank you very much for coming out here oh, very much appreciate it nice to on all of it going on yeah